All right, so the, the, the bad news, Dr. Williams, is that the biologist gets the last word. <laughs> the, uh, actually, the other piece of bad news for me is that I have to follow that. Like, <laughs> the guy with props, unbelievable. Holy cow. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening, and uh, uh, I want to thank the university for the invitation. And I hope I do justice to, uh, to this stage. I, I've actually seen some quite amazing lectures in this room. Uh, in the late 80s, I remember I saw Abby Hoffman here, uh, one, one, of the, one of the more prominent uh, US radicals from the 1960s. And he actually died a few months after he lectured here. Uh, Paul Watson, uh, you know, phenomenal guy, longtime head of the Sea Shepherd Society, still out there chasing Norwegian and Japanese whalers around. He's spoken here a few times. I remember I saw a Gloria Steinem here uh, one year, the, the wonderful US feminist. So I, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope I do this, this stage justice. I have to confess, I'm a bit freaked out this evening, uh, mostly because in thinking about this lecture, I actually had to remember how many years it's been since I started my undergraduate at Guelph. And even though in my mind I'm still 20 years old, um, my wife laughed at that joke. Um, uh, in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm getting terrible. Um, I, I realized in putting together this lecture that it's, I actually started here in 1987, which I first arrived here on campus in 1987. So I want to put you in the mood for my remarks this evening by surveying the landscape of, uh, of 1987. <laughs> and, uh, so there's a little, uh, little time travel flashback here. In 1987, Maureen Mancuso's nodding knowledgeably. <laughs> She's nodding knowledgeably. White Snake was the top of the charts in 1987. People had a lot more hair back then. Uh, I had a lot more hair. Uh, so White Snake was uh, here. People had a lot more hair. Leonardo DiCaprio, however, uh, in the middle, hadn't started shaving yet. Um, the the, uh, the, the, this is a true story. The only source of music at the Albion was a jukebox that played real records. <laughs> and uh, like, it was incredible, it was this thing. Anyway, so it, uh, that, was, that was all we had at the Albion was this jukebox. Uh, the Simpsons started in 1987. You'll note the drawing looks a little bit more primitive than it does now. <laughs> Uh, Bart, like unrecognizable, right? Uh, and the world looked a lot different too in, in 1987. So Nelson Mandela was uh, still three years away from being released. The, uh, the Berlin Wall hadn't fallen yet. Uh, Brian Mulroney was about to be elected uh, for a second time. The, uh, the, the, <laughs> hadn't been invented yet, <laughs> right? So we used these crazy things, libraries, <laughs> and we used books made from paper. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was kind of a crazy thing. So I actually, I actually remember the, the first, my first hour of my first day here on this campus. I was fleeing my parents' house in uh, Richmond Hill, suburban. Is everybody here from Richmond Hill, York Region? Nice one. Anyway, so I, was, I, I fled here from Richmond Hill, and I, 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 you know, I, I landed here on campus and moved into Lenox Addington, and uh, my first hour here, I was desperate. I was like, you know, desperate to find where the cool campus activists were hanging out. So I remember I walked into Oberg, and they seemed kind of nice, but, you know, kind of low-key. They didn't seem hardcore enough for me. <laughs> uh, so then I, that evening, and I have a distinct memory of this, <laughs> that, that evening I actually went to the meeting of the Communist Party of Canada Marxist-Leninist. Because they'd given me a paper that day, and their, the font, like the font of the newspaper was really cool. It was all sort of black and red, and they called you comrade, and they had a really firm handshake. So I, I thought, cool, I'll go, I'll go out. And then I went four hours, I kid you not, four hours we were harangued on why uh, the model for human civilization uh, should be Albania. And uh, then I realized, I realized that this wasn't for me. And so I went back to Oberg uh, the next day. <laughs> but, uh, but that was the beginning. I was totally hooked, right? I was, I was seduced 
by the richness of campus life here for the next 10 years. Um, and frankly, it was a little bit like the, to the Godfather part three, uh, to quote from that movie, just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Uh, I moved from the CSA to the University Board of Governors, to the GSA, I was like a junkie, I couldn't get out. GSA, Board of Governors, uh, organized a union for, for teaching assistance. Uh, I was arrested at an arms exhibition to protest the sale of weapons to apartheid South Africa. Uh, arrested at forest blockades in Tomogamy, and all the while I was pretending to do my science degree. Um, my, friend, uh, my friend Marty Williams, uh, who's here this evening, uh, has often threatened to write a book about student culture and activism at Guelph because it's such a long and amazing history, and I wish he would uh, write that book. Uh, because universities, you know, because of difficult to uh, quantify factors. Maybe it's because of the people that founded them, or maybe it's because of the place they're in, or maybe it's because of the disciplines that the students that are attracted to that university uh, come to study. Whatever the reason, universities acquire a character over time. They build up a kind of DNA that's inherited by each subsequent generation. And a proud tradition of students getting results by getting active is what makes this place tick. It always has been, and, uh, and I think it always will be. Uh, you know, this building that we're standing in, I mean, you may know this story, but uh, this building that we're standing in, built in 1924, it's on this site for a reason, and the, the reason is because students wanted it here. Uh, apparently, uh, the, the administration at the time was uh, taking its sweet time trying to figure out where to build this thing, and students said, well, screw it. Uh, one night they came out and they cut down a bunch of trees in this location and they excavated the foundations in the middle of the night and then the administration was forced to build this building here. <laughs> and if you think, actually it makes a lot of sense, if you think about the, this would have been early 1920s, so these would have been like uh, farm, farm boys returning from the war, right? So I'm not sure you would have, if you were a university administrator, I'm not sure you would have wanted to, screw, and they were, drink, they were drinking at the Albion the night before. <laughs> so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure you would have wanted to screw with them uh, that much. Um, the Guelph Campus Co-op, uh, one, one of the oldest student cooperatives in North America. It'll be 100 years old in two years' time, still going strong. And, uh, and as I was preparing uh, this talk this week, uh, the images of this amazing uh, vote mob were national news this week. Was, was anybody here at this event? You know, phenomenal. You know, 500 people, I heard 500 people at this, at this event, something like that. Like that's like 25% of the city of Guelph or something, <laughs> All right? Like incredible turnout. We can't get 500 people to anything in Toronto. So you know the the, the tradition lives on. Uh, so here's here's the simple truth, of the the unvarnished truth. I am a professional shit disturber, and uh, I'm not sure I'd be doing what I'm doing today had I not graduated from from this university. Uh, so I'm not sure what that says about your chances uh, later in life, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, uh, that's my story. Uh, I think my entrance into the environmental movement uh, could only have happened the way it did at Guelph. Uh, you may not know this, but up until the late 1990s, Guelph was one of the places in the world that you would go to study marine mammal biology. So generations of students went through here learning about uh, seals and whales. Uh, and at one point, we actually had uh, uh, about 20 seals on campus in, in two facilities. One of them was an indoor facility um, over by uh, Zoology Annex 1. The other one was an outdoor facility in the Arboretum. And uh, seals, you may know, have very uh, incredible loud vocalizations that, depending on the day, sound like uh, little babies or people being strangled to death. <laughs> So not infrequently, the campus police would get uh, phone calls in the middle of the night from students at East Residence, you know, petrified, you know, there's someone being murdered outside <laughs> my door. They're coming for me. It's horrible. Right? And it would be the seals out in the, uh, out in the Arboretum, about you know, 10, 15 seals out, uh, living out in the Arboretum. They're not there anymore, alas. But um, uh, Dave Levine, who I was very lucky to have as a thesis advisor, is here this evening. 
one of the renowned uh, marine mammal experts in the world, still, uh, still works in town. Uh, and so I was trained as a seal biologist. I graduated as a seal biologist. And uh, inevitably in this country, when you divulge the fact that you're a seal biologist at a dinner party or at Christmas dinner, uh, you're asked to comment on the seal hunt, of course. What do you think about the seal hunt? So you quickly have to develop a, a, an opinion. Um, and I found myself working on the seal hunt, uh, trying to stop it. Uh, I found myself uh, observing the hunt year after year, standing in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the seal hunt, uh, trying to bring some sense to a basically senseless situation. Uh, so it was as a Guelph-trained biologist trying to stick up for defenseless animals that I started doing what I still do today.